Good morning, FPC 1115. How are you today? We want to we talk about heaven today? Yeah. yeah, enough of hell, yeah. That's good. Uh, my wife and I packed all of our earthly belongings in a van last night that left at 9 o'clock from our house in Fresno. So you're stuck with us now. We're, we're, we're homeless and we'd really like to move in with you. If you but, uh, there's this man and his wife that got sick and tired of the cold up in Seattle. It had been snowing, it was a terrible winter. They wanted a nice warm vacation in southern Florida. So they were flying and the, the wife had to take a business trip in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But the guy was just going to fly straight down to South Florida. And uh, when the man got to the airport, there was some trouble at the gate and they'd overbooked. And he tried to moan and groan and contest it, but the airline said it wasn't their fault. So there went, it wasn't going to happen even if he talked to the supervisor. He was just going to have to fly on a later flight. He was upset. He got there late, but he got there. Wife went on to Minneapolis. So he arrives at the hotel, and it's really, really hot in Florida. And uh, it, it's, it's as hot in Florida as it was cold up in Seattle. So he, he stops. He checks in. The clerk says, I've got confirmation. Your wife's going to be here tomorrow. And the guy said, I'm just going to get my swimming suit on. I'm going to rush down to the pool. i got to cool off in this nice warm weather here. Florida. So he jots off a really quick email note to his wife, sends it off, but he sent it to the wrong address. And in fact, what happened was his message actually ended up in the inbox of an elderly preacher's wife whose husband had just died the day before. And when the grieving widow opened her email, she took one look at the monitor, let out an anguished scream, fainted and fell to the floor, and her family rushed in. And they found her on the floor and saw this message on the computer screen, Dearest wife, departed yesterday, as you know. Just now got checked in. Some confusion at the gate. <laughs> Appeal was denied. <laughs> Received confirmation of your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> your loving husband, P.S. Things are not as we thought. You're going to be surprised at how hot it is down here. <laughs> just read what it's You know, uh, we talked about hell last week. We are talking about heaven this week. You know, one of the roles of your new pastor is to disturb the comforted. I'm supposed to comfort the disturbed, but I'm also supposed to disturb the comforted. So, take that. Uh, we're in our final stretch on a series of messages called Start with the end in view, and uh, we're trying to answer the question, where are you going to be when you get where you're going? And do you have clarity on that? And we said last week that Jesus Christ one day, it, it, here's the Son of God who is going to actually speak to the entire earth, and all people that have ever lived and died will come forth from their graves, be bodily resurrected, and will stand before the great white throne of judgment before God. And these are the words of Christ himself in John chapter 5, where he says, the time is coming. When all who are in their graves will hear His voice, the voice of the Son of God, and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Pretty clear. Now I want you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Because this is the passage that speaks about the final judgment. And it speaks with absolute clarity about what will happen on that day when we stand resurrected before our Maker and our lives are evaluated. So I just want you to read this with me, okay? Revelation chapter 20, we're going to pick it up at verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. In other words, you cannot escape. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. We talked about that last week. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That is what is called the final judgment, or the great white throne of judgment. And it is only after human beings have all been bodily resurrected, so soul and body will be joined together, and we stand before God and we're judged, it is only after that event that the eternal states of what we call heaven and hell begin. We talked about hell 
last week. We'll talk about heaven this week. And I just want to draw your attention to something. We've already sold 500 of these or more this morning. But Randy Alcorn has written a really great book on heaven. And uh, I recommend you get the whole book, but it's like 500 pages long. This is the Reader's Digest version of that book, and it's about 55 pages long. And it's common questions asked about heaven. We, we picked them up for a buck. We're selling them for a buck. And we've got some of them still out there in the reception area in the library. So I recommend you read that. Talk, talk with your kids about that. Work, that. work through that material because this is this, all of us are going to face these eternal realities. So it's good to know, right? Now, we have, a, we have a memory verse we're all going to learn together this morning, okay? Everybody say 1 Corinthians 2.9. 2 now, read it with me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Now, let's do it again. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. So, we're going we're gonna to memorize that this week and next week, and then we're going to have a quiz, and if you can't get it right, you have to give $10 towards our debt uh, payment, all right? But uh, having said that, let's dive right in. First of all, I want you to know that heaven is something that's been promised by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is not a pie in the sky thing. Jesus Christ himself promises, and we can't see heaven right now. But Jesus has told us very explicitly that it does exist and that he is actually currently preparing a place for those who love him. And he will come back and take us to be with him where he is. My mom and dad, Ken and Donna Hansen, are here this morning. Would you say hi to my mom and dad? Say hi. Well, I come from a family of four boys, so bless my mom. She cleaned the bathrooms. And, uh, yeah, that's just nasty. Man, that's nasty. But my oldest brother was actually killed in a car accident in 1977, and when they went to get his effects, they found an open Bible on the table next to his bed, open to this very passage I want you to read this morning. So it's very meaningful to me. It's in the Gospel of John. We're going to come back to Revelation, but I'd like you to put notes right there or something. But we're going to go to the fourth Gospel of the New Testament, fourth book, John chapter 14. And we're going to read the words of our Lord. First three verses. First three verses. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples during the Last Supper, speaking to all future followers as well. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And I have to say, I've followed the Lord Jesus since 1977. And if he says something, I believe it, it's good enough for me. But not for all people. There's some people that think that what Christians believe is ridiculous. Karl Marx, the father of communism, said this. He said, religion, and particularly Christianity, is the opiate of the masses. It was invented to try to make bad people good. Karl Marx said, people cannot really be happy until they've been deprived of illusory happiness by the abolition of religion. To which I say, how's that working for you, Karl? You see, Jesus tells us heaven exists. And Jesus tells us that all God lovers can bet our eternity on it. So who are you going to believe? The world of philosophy today is rather anti-Christian as well. One famous philosopher said this recently. He said, as for Christian theology, can you imagine anything more appallingly idiotic than the Christian idea of heaven? And yet Jesus said, trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. So again, I ask you, who are you going to believe? Because either heaven is pie in the sky, wishful thinking, and should be dismissed with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, or it's the truth and we should bet the house on it and allow it to change our thinking as we live with the end in view. I recommend Plan B to. Now, here's the problem. I've been a Christian for over three decades now, and what I've noticed, even among Christian leaders, is a real fuzziness, haziness, fogginess when it comes to heaven. And so if you're not clear about where you're going and what it'll be like, it kind of dilutes your walk to get there. You know what I mean? And so let me give you just one working principle this morning, and then we're going to kind of beef it up as time goes on. But here it is, if you're like filling in the blanks this morning. 
an uncertain end goal will result in a foggy, fruitless, defeated journey. An uncertain end goal will result in a foggy, fruitless, defeated journey. One lady once actually told me that heaven sounded boring. She said, I just can't imagine sitting around on clouds all day long, wearing halos, playing harps, and drinking lemonade or coffee. And I said, honey, that's Hollywood's invention of heaven. That sounds like hell to me. I don't want any of that. That is not heaven. And if you think that what you've seen on TV is the best depiction you're going to get of heaven, you need to go back to the Bible because it's got a lot of clarity that isn't lemonade oriented. Okay? That's just creepy, Frank. Okay? Um, so where are you going to be when you get where you're going? What are you going to have when you get what you want? If we don't have clarity about where we're going to end up and what we're going to be, what we're seeking in life, why should it surprise any of us? If the journey to get there is weak, and it's compromised, it's confusing, it's lukewarm, and it's just plain old wimpy like three-day-old spaghetti. You know, I think we need a lot more clarity on this one. So, let me add to that clarity just a little bit. There's some people that say, you know, the idea of living forever in a perfect place sounds very boring. At least in this lifetime, we have problems and challenges and threats that keep us from being bored. How could you not be bored in a perfect place? And let me just let me just start by saying point number two is that heaven's going to be anything but boring. Fasten your seatbelts, people. Uh, none of us are capable of completely understanding what heaven is going to be like because none of us are capable of understanding what reality is like without sin and evil and the curse. But let's turn on our imagination just a little bit because this is our Father's world. He made it perfect and then it fell into sin. But there's still glimpses of heaven right here in this world that we live in right now that whisper to us some of what's coming in the future. Thousands of facial nuances when we communicate with people. The promise of a newborn baby. You ever smell the skin of a newborn baby? Yeah, it's just good stuff. I've got five and a half grandkids. I'm used to that. Uh, one of them's still in the oven. Uh, the power of romantic love. Even though it promises more than it delivers. Um, great works of art, poetry, music that moves us. Here's a good one. I think it's totally cool that God loaded up your tongue with taste buds. I want to say, everybody show your buddies. All right? You know, now think about that. He could have made you like a cow to eat grass, but instead he gave you all these taste buds because he's totally into pleasure. That's why we should all head down to Pan Express and eat honey walnut shrimp after the service, okay? Because I'm just telling you, man. They dance across your tongue and say, woo! Yeah, whatever, okay. All right, eat Asian salad at uh, Chick fil A, okay, if you're on diet. Okay. Uh, where was I? <laughs> The third service, I'm getting a little punchy. All right, listen. When's the last time you looked at flowers, for example? Flowers reflect this glory and majesty, and they scream God. There's color, there's texture, there's symmetry, there's complexity in the midst of simplicity, and they all scream glory and give us little glimpses of what's to come. Can you imagine? God made this world in six days. And Jesus is a carpenter and he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. You think we're going to get an upgrade? <laughs> really? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, listen, God has made this world. Therefore, the earth is the image of heaven, though it is fallen. It's not a part of hell. And if earth is a fragmentary fallen image of heaven, we know at least three things about heaven. First of all, we know that heaven is more real and substantial than earth. And most people think, no, heaven is kind of thin and wispy and cloudy and nebulous. No, that's Hollywood's depiction of heaven, folks. It's the earth that's wispy as the wind, not heaven. You see, if you go back all the way to the Garden of Eden, you'll discover that heaven and earth were separated when mankind fell into sin because God cannot dwell in the presence of sin. And so heaven and earth were separated. And what we're told is in the end that heaven and earth, the sin will be abolished and heaven and earth will come back together again. That's what the Bible actually teaches. 
And so heaven is going to be a physical place. It's going to be a spiritual place, but it's going to be a physical place as well. I found one quote that I thought was really cool. I think I put it in your sermon online. We are not human beings having a temporary spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a temporary human experience. Think about that. You were made in the image of God. God is spirit. You're fundamentally spiritual. And be ready to have your spirits rocked when your God takes you home. But it will be a physical place too. We will enter heaven with our bodies. Number two, we know about heaven, is, is that heaven has more dimensions than earth. Not fewer. Heaven's not merely spiritual. I said it's a, it's a physical place, but probably with additional dimensions. We live in a three-dimensional world. Could you imagine heaven being like an eight-dimensional world or a 20-dimensional world with new sounds and new colors and new smells and new experiences and new sensory capacities to perceive and enjoy it? We lost a lot in the fall, people. We're getting it all back and more. Even as you think about the resurrected body that we're going to do, you guys know we're going to get new suits? You know, and I, they got to carve a bunch of patents off right here. They just got to pile up right here. I just look at it, don't it? Just, 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 just. But as you think about your heavenly body, go back to the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, when we see him, we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is in 1 John. And so I want you to understand, Jesus' body, when he rose from the dead, they could see it, they could touch it, he could eat fish. That's a good body, you know. But it could also pass through walls. It could appear and disappear at will. It could defy gravity. Anybody into a new suit like that? You see what I'm saying? Think of the ascension, just right through the devil's territory. Satan is the god of the air, and Jesus is going right through his territory. Wait, what are you doing? <laughs> and so, heaven has more dimensions than earth, not fewer dimensions than earth. And, and thirdly, heaven, heaven is clearer and more detailed and specific than earth, not vaguer. There are so many things that are out of focus because of our current fallen world. Sin brings spiritual fog. Sin throws us in the land of gray. But I'm just telling you that you've got a lot of black and white snappy clarity coming when God lets his people into his eternal dwelling called heaven. Everything was subjected to the curse in Genesis 3. Everything was subjected to death. All the lines became blurry. But we will, sure, we will soon see a clear, sharp, vivid, defined, perfect place called heaven that will make this place seem boring. Let's do our Bible memory verse together again. Ready? No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. We're going to live in a glorified body without limits of the earth. We're going to be given new assignments to serve God. We're not going to sit around doing nothing. That sounds like hell to me. We're probably going to live continually on the verge of sensory overload as we experience the uncensored glory of God. And I guarantee you, you will not miss your favorite television programs. You will not miss your favorite sporting events or even your favorite food. I don't know if honey bowl and shrimp is even going to be in heaven. I don't know. Probably not. There's no death. The shrimp have to die for you to eat them. So, well, three. Three. That's a depressing song, right? Yeah, I'm going to work on that one. Three. What will not be there? What will not be there in heaven? Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says this. It says the old order of things has passed away. Revelation 22 3 says no longer will there be any curse. Whoa, what a place. If you're in Revelation, look at verse 27 of the 21st chapter. It says nothing impure will enter heaven nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing in heaven will be marred by sin or evil. Absolutely nothing. So, let me, let me just, just go on a rant for a second, okay? Here's, this is interesting. We are so used to this fallen world and death and separation that we can't even conceive of a place without this stuff. So the Bible spends more time telling us what will not be in heaven than what will be in heaven so we get the picture. So it's okay if I do a little bit of a rant right now? All right, fasten your seatbelt. No more sea. 
People and nations have been divided long enough. No more pain. The whole pharmaceutical and medical industry wiped out with a single stroke. No more hospitals, injuries, cancer, disease, accidents. No more bad news. No more economic disasters. No more stealing. No more hurt your feelings. No more money. So you should give it now to our debt retirement. No more earthquakes. No more tsunamis, hurricanes, global warming, violation of the environment. No more tears. Yeah, someone's celebrating over there about that. No more depression or fear or aging. Anxiety, worry, anger, jealousy, hatred, or unforgiveness. No more hunger, poverty, social injustice, rape, physical abuse, or other destructive behaviors. No more car or life insurance. No more burglar alarms. No need to lock your doors since we'll have the ultimate angelic security gate to guard us forever from trespassers. No more lying. No more half-truths. No more religious presumption. No more, be no more betrayal. No more hypocrisy. No more Satan. No more demons. No more lies or temptation, accusation, or hellish deception. No more hiding behind projected Im images of ourselves, which really are not truthful. No more loneliness or meaninglessness. No more death. No more mourning. No more crying. Heaven will be a city without a cemetery. Wow. So bye-bye to funerals, graveyards, obituary columns, and Kleenex. No more marriage. In the second hour, we heard a bunch of hallelujahs to that. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Just wanted to see if you're paying attention. No more heart crushing that comes from the grave robbing us of loved ones. No more coward. Look at, look at chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21. Look at, look at verse 8. My goodness, it tells you some things that won't be there. It says, it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magical arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. None of that in heaven. No more cheap substitutes for the high that only God can bring. No more AIDS, no more substance abuse, no more occultic practices, witchcraft, false religions, or idolatry. No more temple, because the temple is just a shadow of things to come. God will be our dwelling place in heaven. No more darkness, no more night. Yeah, that's what it says, chapter 21, verse 25. No more night there, chapter 22, verse 5. In case you missed it the first time. No more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So goodbye to smud, goodbye to PG&E. Listen, uh, no more bills. Yeah, because there's no more money, so get over it, right? No more weeds, no more mosquitoes, no more cockroaches, no more unhealthy food, no more diet programs. Hallelujah. No more scales to step on and then groan. Oh, brother. No more godless entertainment or blasphemous art. I accidentally turned on scandal a couple of nights ago and was scandalized. Ain't going to be in heaven. No more mockery of what is holy, good, right, or pure. No more threats of harm to our children. I just want you to know it is not normal to talk about guns in elementary school in the same sentence. There will be none of that. No more threats to anybody. The effects of the curse will be overdone, gone, bye-bye. Sin has left the cube-shaped city of God. And in heaven there's one more thing there won't be any of. Evangelism. Reaching out. Missions. Because we have to do it now. There will be no more lost people in heaven. That's why God isn't rushing to the conclusion of this present chapter of human history. Because his family isn't big enough. There's still a lot of lost people in Elk Grove, folks. And quite frankly, if you want to go to heaven and you want to go there alone, you're selfish. We should want to take people with us when we go. If hell is that bad and heaven is that good, we need to talk about it. People need to know Jesus is alive and we need to put, we need to put skin on Jesus with our neighbors. More on that next week. You went real quiet on me there, didn't you? Now let's talk a little bit about what heaven, what, what will be there in heaven, okay? It was probably about three or four years ago that I decided to read through the Quran, the, the Holy Book of the Muslims. It's not that hard to read. It's less, it's not even as long as the New Testament. But I was a little surprised when I ran into the Muslim definition of heaven or paradise. Because as Muhammad depicts it, it's really for men. 
And it's like in a desert oasis where men are lying on low, soft couches, being served by all these young people and dark-eyed virgins, and they're allowed to indulge in all the carnal pleasure, pleasures that they haven't denied themselves on earth. And I, in all due respect, what a low view of God. Is, is that the best, that God would have us indulge in the sins that we couldn't be involved in on earth? That that's the best that heaven or paradise has to offer? I think not. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that when believers are resurrected, we will be clothed with immortality. We will enjoy a newly transformed body which is perfectly fit for heavenly dwelling. Sin and the curse will be no more and we will finally be home. What a beautiful concept. What a beautiful word. Home. Say that. Home. Do you know, it's not just pigeons that have a homing device inside them. It's human beings as well. Every time you see something broken or fallen or diseased or in pain, I hope you think, we are not home yet. That is not meant to be permanent. Do not get used to death. Death will be swallowed up in life, the Bible says. In heaven we're told there will be perfect peace, undiluted comfort, love like we've never experienced before, absolute well-being and perfect community. No shame, no guilt. I imagine new colors, new dimensions, new sensory capacities can take it all in. Revelation chapter 21 presents heaven as this enormous cube-shaped city about the size of America and about the height as well. Go figure. With secure walls and secure gates and translucent golden streets. This is fascinating to me. What is so precious on earth among men, that yellow metal, will be the pavement of our streets in heaven. We'll walk on it and see through it. Just amazing. The river of life will be there. The tree of life will be there. Remember, we got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We haven't had access to the tree of life for a long time. We're going back to paradise. I'm going to be eating at that tree. Move over. <laughs> Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 puts it this way. It says, then, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven. And the first earth had passed away. And then five verses later, it says, He who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. Would you say those words with me? I am making everything new. Now emphasize the word everything. Ready? I am making everything new. Don't tell anybody I told you this. But sometimes I go out and I test drive new cars. And I have no intention to buy them. <laughs> I just love the smell of new cars. That's so good. It's, it's, it's right after I eat one of my sandwiches. That's so good. This world is not your final destination, you know that? It's not home. So don't put everything in this world because you're not supposed to be entirely comfortable here. We're not home yet. In Revelation chapter, I think it's in chapter 21, it says, I saw, verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. My last point this morning is, is that heaven is really more about a person than a place. Heaven is really more about a person than a place. It's about God. You, God, us, and God. Uh, I have some people I really want to meet in heaven. I want to meet Josiah. I want to meet Hezekiah. I want to meet Moses, I want to meet Abraham, I want to meet Esther, I want to meet Paul and Mary, and I want to fly and get my new assignment, and I want to see people that I love that have gone on and crossed the, the river of death, physical death already. I want to drink from the river of life, I want to eat from the tree of life, I want to check out the angels, experience everything about this amazing place, I want to walk on the translucent streets of gold, skip and dance, and that's, I know Baptists aren't supposed to dance, but that's what I plan to do. Um, I want to see the gates, the 12 gates. And, you know, the Bible says they're literally entire tunnels. 
And, and my bet is, is that the redeemed can walk in and out as much as they want, right through the pearls, because we'll be able to walk through walls. But the, the wicked is going to be able to come in. Cast out. I don't know, maybe that's just imagination. But I do want to tell you this. Heaven is not heaven if God is not there. Because heaven is really more about a person than a place. Because all our lives, whether you realize it or not, you want to look at your maker in the face and be accepted. The worst part about hell is, is that God will be conspicuously absent. The best place, the best part about heaven is, is that you will no longer have to believe in God. You will see God and not die. Wow! You'll be able to take it in. Continually, Jesus, one of his favorite names was Emmanuel. You know what that means? God with us. And we have Jesus spiritually with us right now, but we are going to physically be in the presence of God and see him all the time. We won't even need any light. There will be no more night because God, you know, in the temple there was the Shekinah glory of God that lit up the Holy of Holies. You're going to have God's very presence be the light for heaven so it's always day. He's just always going to give light. I see light going through our bodies something just shining everywhere. We'll talk more about light shining at another time, but that's a good one. But, but really, I want to see God. And when I, when I see God, this is just sort of the little boy in me coming out. I want God to tell me I did a good job. I want God to tell me that I didn't get it perfect, but I, I had a valiant struggle against the sin nature in my body. That I actually believed the Bible and taught other people to believe the Bible. That I fought against prevailing culture. That I told the gospel to people. That I represented Jesus. Oh, I want God to tell me, Scott, good job. I want to make God happy. Do you want to make God happy? Do you want to make God happy? Because, you know, I think sometimes today we don't think we can make God happy. He's just too hard to please. And that's... That's the public, that's friends, that's the teachers, that's you can please God. You really can. There was this man that was dying and he went to visit his doctor. And as he was leaving the examination room, he knew the doctor was Christian, so he just turned and said what he was afraid to say. He said, Doctor, I'm afraid to die. And I know I'm about to die. So can you're a Christian guy, can you just tell me what's on the other side? And the doctor looked at him and kind of shocked him. He said, you know, I'm not really sure of all the details. He goes, you're a Christian. For crying out loud, why wouldn't you know what's happening on the other side? I mean, you seem so peaceful and you seem so together, but you don't even know what's on the other side. How can you help me? He said, wait, 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 before you get all out of bother. Then all of a sudden there was this scratching and yelping and, and, and yearning and crying on the other side of the door. And the doctor had his hand on the knob of the door and he said, you know, you know what that is? And he said, no, he said, that's my dog. And he said, you need to know that my dog has never been in this room before. So my dog has no clue what's in this room, except for me. He hears his master's voice, and he has no fear. He just wants to be with his master. So I'm telling you right now, I'm not so sure about all the details of heaven, but I know when I get there, my master will be there, and that's good enough. And then he opened the door, and the dog just came and just accosted him. You know? what, a, what a great picture that if God is there, that is enough. You will never outgive God, you'll never outgrace God. And we remember, because we have a memory verse, and let's say it one last time No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared. For those who love it. I just leave you with a kind of a final thought here. The only thing that's making it out of this present world is people. There's, you're not going to take stuff with you. At 9 o'clock last night, the movers moved all of our stuff away. And I'm clueless where it went, okay? All of our stuff. You're not taking any of it. But my dad reminded me. There's no, there's no trailers behind bursts, okay? With your stuff. So let's get it right. Let's start with the interview. Let's get it right. Get these issues right. One last question. Eternal life. True or false? It starts when you die. Don't answer that question. We'll see you next week to be continued. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this day. 
Thank you for your servants. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for spilled blood on a cross that bought us forever. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that even though we don't deserve it, you grace us all the time. Thank you for the hope and the promise of heaven. And God, I pray that you help us to live heaven's realities, even in the here and now, because we're headed to a better place, working off of better blueprints. We love you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.